Before I start, I have to apologize because it's a con it's not um, research about play, but it's research in general uh, about learning and development. But I took a PhD thesis really, uh, and it's called the developmental psychological perspective on creative, creative imagination and play, how different toys influence children's play. And I'm sure uh, if anybody is interested in this PhD thesis, they can get it electronic from the author. It's Signe U. Müller. You can just give me your name or an email address and I will write to her. Um, this is a research approach I'm trying to present to you. And uh, my main idea and I was really glad uh, when Andreas introduced this uh, boot camp, or what you call it, um, saying that experiment is always important for you in this research. An experiment can be many things. It can be natural experiments. You just look at what is coming up when a child has consent from one institution to another, children's consent, or it can be differences, but there always have to be some, some contrast. So I'm going to talk about um, making participant observation, and I call it the um, participant interact, participant interact, acting uh, observation. But you could easily come to think that when I talk about observation, it's just going out and uh, being in the anthropological mood alone. But I think also this is very important, but it is also very important in this uh, experimental approach. So it's to combine these two things. Um, I would start, I have planned uh, to give you a small exercise, and you will get it. It's only half a page of observation, and it's some central concept you are going to use. Um, but now I present uh, the concepts, uh, and the central concepts for me are motives and demands. Uh, I call this the interaction-based participant observation, and this is a methodology for studying children in the everyday life in historical settings. And I think it's very important to both the everyday life and the historical settings. You can, uh, it's not that I object to doing experimental research uh, in uh, laboratories, but it's to think of the experiments you're doing in relation to everyday life. And, and why they are important in relation to everyday life. And the, the, when you're doing uh, observation in everyday life, in a uh, historical setting, the problem is always to transcend the specific. You are making this very concrete observation of some two children playing in a kindergarten, and how do you get to know anything from this, except that they are playing together. How do you get some of the things we would like to know about the understanding of what is going on, the understanding of creativity, the understanding of learning, the understanding of development? And there we need theory, and we need theory even before we go out and making the observation, because the theory that we have may, may us, make us look in a certain way. And that's, for this reason, it's necessary to be explicit on what is your theoretical basis. And here I say that there are four paradigms, <coughs> at least in psychology. But I also think they count for all of us, um, anthropology and soci sociology, but you can discuss this with me. 
But the first one is the mechanic uh, way of looking at children's learning and development. And it is this that they get influenced and there are some reactions. It's the Skinner approach, but it's actually dominating very much also today. Then there is the organismic, that is the PSG approach. That's why I didn't want to respond to Lars because you said Vygotsky and PSG in the same group. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because PSC have some uh, whole idea with PSC is that he has some ideas of the are uh, uh, stages that all <coughs> persons get to in their life course, and these are biologically determinated. It's not that they are not influenced by the environment, but these are in being in being a human. And there's in some way nothing wrong with it having the first paradigm or having the next paradigm, but I don't think it's enough to understand when you want to understand learning and development or uh, creativity or play. Then there is the third, and it's very dominating today. It is that, of course, everybody live in an environment and we have to look at the person in the environment. Uh, in psychology, uh, there is Brontenbrenner, uh, but all Actually, also, uh, Vygotsky has been taken into this uh, paradigm. It is that if we can describe the environment, then we can describe the individual in relation to this environment, then we have everything. But this is not good enough. I'm sorry, I, uh, this person I took to the everyday life in young children, even if he lists these four paradigms, he don't get through with the last one. And this is formism, he called it. But this is that, what last is called Bindung or Dannelse. We are all, and it's to find, uh, or I call it development. Uh, we ha have to find out how people's life are created and how they are created as persons to exploring this in experimental settings. And experimental settings can be this everyday uh, life course settings where we describe uh, what influenced the child, but what we also have to describe is how the child influenced the content context so that it's this dialectic we have to have both not only how the the environment influences the child, this is contextual, but it's how the child or the person creates its own conditions for learning and development, being in the context. So how do we uh, get this, uh, this into do research? This is what I'm going to talk about here. And there we have um, I, I draw on, I call it the cultural historical approach. Um, I know I was once in anthropology, and as I, I work from a cultural historical uh, approach, their hair stand out, and I couldn't understand, they think I was foolish. But it's because they, they at least, what I was explained at that time, it's this uh, idea that uh, cu some cultures are better than others. And this is not the idea with a cultural historical approach. The culture is more to understand what are the traditions that create the everyday life, and the, um, the historical is this that there are always changes. So, and it's this because Kalkune and Leontief are built on, and um, what is important in their research is that this input, output, or stimulus reaction process uh, or transformation of com competencies uh, they are changed into concepts of activity, motive, and goal and they analyze uh, learning and development uh, from the concept of the demands that follows from, from this. So it's you know, motives or goals uh, not only on the persons, 
but also of the institutional practices that the people participate in and the demands from this. And you, it, perhaps it seems complicated, but it is to get this dynamic that is important. Uh, Leontier's activity port has, uh, has to be seen as a new paradigm for persons learning and development that use a dialectic lot that use dialectical logic instead of the logic of cause and effect, and thereby uh, it's possible to formulate the unity between the person and the life world, between person and environment. And it, this unity is this that it's not only that the context influence the persons, but it's also that the persons influence the context. Humans uh, do not simply find external conditions to which they must adapt their activity, rather these social conditions bear with them the motives and goals of their activity, its means and modes, motives. Mental reflection of the object world is not produced directly by ex external influences, but by processes to which the subject enter into practical contact with the object world. In connection with the analysis of activity, it is sufficient to point out that it is object, that its objective produce not only the objective character, character of images, but also object orientation of desires and emotions. And this uh, object orientation of desires and emotions, this is what characterizes persons. The other concept is the demands. And this is um, the dialectic between person and his environment. It is this relation between demands and motives. What is important, and what we, instead of uh, talking about stimulus, it is to think about that children need demands, or persons need demands from the environment. They need demands from the <coughs> material environment. For instance, when we enter a room, we relate to what is in this room. There is chairs, there is tables, there is coffee. Uh, and the way the, the material uh, world is formed, it, it is demands to the persons who enter into this um, material world. But it's also demands uh, in the social world. Uh, there's demands from the practices we participate in. Now we participate in um, a conference or workshop meeting, and this practice, put demands that we <coughs> keep the time, that we uh, make questions to each other. There's also demands in personal interaction. If somebody come and talk to me personally, uh, ask me questions or try to give me coffee, it's uh, both uh, kindness, or but it's also demands for me to react. And this is another way to think about how you persons relate to the world instead of the assimilated. We always, always meet demands. And the other way is, how do I orient myself in this world? And this is not a free or orientation. It's an orientation that are based on what is important for me. This is an orientation uh, for, for, uh, in relation to uh, my motives, I call it motive orientation, um, but also in, in relation to the possibilities that <coughs> are in this situation. So these um, two concepts of motives and demands, they are related uh, to the concept of practice. 
and I don't know, I'm a psychologist, so I'm so used to um, the Vygotskian approach in psychology, and I don't know how used you are to the Vygotskian approach in psychology, but that's where I relate myself. So when I, uh, the next slide I say, I um, extend the Vygotskian approach in psychology because what characterizes the Vygotskian approach is that it's a person in relation to the world or in relation to society. Uh, and also if you take the uh, Leontief, he used the concept of activity or action um, and it's the most important way that person relates to the world, they participate in activity and they act. Uh, this is the primary thing. Uh, <coughs> but I think it's important to extend this with the concept of practice. And this comes from uh, Leib and Wenger, uh, some of the first, uh, and from anthropology, that uh, practice is really what matters for learning is to participate in, in practice. And when you go to uh, Leib and Wenger, this concept of, of practice, it's, it can be um, the carpenter's practice, or the practice in, in housewife's practice. It, it's not related, I, I call it a free-floating practice. In some way it is related to institution, but in some way it's not related to institution in, in the way they describe it. And I think it's very important to relate practice to institution. And the first uh, um, what also is the problem if you use um, practice as practicality or as action. So when I talk about practice, it is practice in institution. And practice in an institution is the basic for learning and development. And this is one point where I, I transcend Lars' approach because you don't have a concept of practice, at least as I see it. And I think when we should talk about play, when we should talk about learning, we should see it in relation to the practice that the children participate in. So learning is, uh, and play is different in the practice at home and uh, in kindergarten or, <coughs> or if it goes on in school, you can talk about learning uh, all places. And you can talk about play all places but it's different in relation to the practice that is going on because this practice put different demands on the persons who participate in the, in the practice. And also thereby the person orients themselves uh, in the motives uh, different to the practice. So now I'm going to show you a model and I call it a Poland's model. Um, and it's a structural model or how I think one should work and when you are doing research about learning, when you are doing research about play, and when you are doing research about development, and play, learning, and development are not the same, but they are related. Um, so it's not to say it's the same. But in psychology, it's always the person you are into, or, or the persons, the children or the adults. But what we actually can do, where we can do our research is in the practice. It is in the school, it is in home, it's at workplaces, it is at the nursery, uh, it is at the hospital. It's always the persons participate in the practice. It's where we do our research. And we have to, uh, when what we are doing research about, we have to conceptualize what practice it's going on when we do the research. But this practice, there are conditions for this practice. And different societies use different conditions uh, for the practice through the, through the traditions, but also through the uh, 
regulation and laws in our society. So you cannot uh, just do whatever you want to do in school, or you cannot do whatever you want to do at home, because if you don't take care of your children, if you are a family, the children will be removed. So there are conditions for the practices, and, this con and there are traditions for the practices, and this we have to conceptualize. And when I'm going to show you, you can see in this, uh, the idea is to, s to say that the children are reading in these practices, but mm -hmm. the, the activity of reading is quite different in the two practices. And it means that the interaction between the other persons are quite different. And when you come back to play <coughs> and learning and, and development, it is the interaction, and that's um, um, what you're going to do. How to do this observation, the concrete way of doing it, I'm not going to talk about. It's described in this small book, uh, Beskrivelse as Smogger, or uh, it was also on the slide in, in, uh, in English, uh, studying children. This uh, way of, of doing the actual uh, going out, uh, collecting the material. So it's not how to go out in, in uh, the daycare institution or go out uh, in a home situation or go out in a school. I've been all places, actually. I've been many places making this observation, sitting with my computer or sitting with my pen and, and pencil. Or my students have done video many, so this is not what I'm going to describe. Um, but even for this, you need a theory. You need to know the aims and the concepts that are important for you when you go out. What I'm going to go on is how do you make interpretation when you have collected your materials? You can. I have students who have collected. Mm, Lots of video material. It's very difficult to get it uh, into uh, a PhD uh, report. So I have collected myself a uh, lot of, of observations, going uh, both in, in the kindergarten and sitting uh, at home or being in school. And when you have this tons and tons of uh, data, uh, it's very difficult. How do you? Uh, uh, get them into um, a way to be able to make interpretation. And this is where these two basic concepts come into. Um, I look at the demands and I look at the, in your, here I call it intention, children's intention. I try to get what I call children's or persons, not only children, because it can also be the teachers the participant's perspective, and there are different perspectives. Um, when I make this model that I just showed you, I call it a wholeness perspective. And this model is not only inspired by the cultural historical tradition from Lugoski, but also from the Levine tradition. Because it's to go into the practice, it's to go into a field and see what forces are in the field. And these forces are this, uh, uh, from the person's perspective, the intention or the person's motive orientation, and from the uh, uh, practice, uh, perspective, um, it is the demands of from the society perspective, it is the demands that are in, in this field. <coughs> and then, if you go back to this model that I showed you, that is a structural model, um, the, the main idea is to, how uh, to get this description of uh, dynamic but it's not really enough to have the concept of practice, because the practice is very unstructured concept. 
Uh, you can have uh, home practice, but a lot is going on, going on in the home. And how can you make situations that can uh, you can describe this is a situation? This is one of the things that has been important. Um, I've been very inspired of, also of Ray McDermott, perhaps you know, he's an anthropologist. One of the things he, he says, when a situation starts and when a situation ends, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get these units you're going to work with. So the unit I'm going to work with, I call them activity setting. It's not, uh, I thought I found, found, found out of this concept, uh, but I didn't. Uh, others have used this concept of activity setting. Um, and it means when you go into the home, you, you can make, uh, for instance, I made observation uh, of children, all the children in the home or in the everyday life starting at home. There's the morning situation where they get out of bed. There's the breakfast situation. There's the, the, uh, their way to school. And if you stay at home, then coming home from school, having afternoon snacks, uh, play time, um, uh, dinner time, going to bed. It's not easy to, uh, it's like some kind of interpretation how to say this is a setting. But this setting is related to what is tradition in your, in the society. So the tradition defines the setting in a society. And if it was in a Spanish <coughs> society, I just went to, uh, have been in Andalusia in Seville, they have two hours break for lunch. Their settings are quite different. They go home, if you go to the university, my university colleagues, they have teaching always at least to eight or nine o'clock in the evening. We couldn't dream of this, but then they have uh, uh, take off uh, this brief lunch break. Uh, and they start next morning at 8 o'clock. It's crazy, I would think. But it, it is the tradition to find this activity setting. But it is in, actually in this activity setting, the interaction between persons in this activity setting and the demands in this setting that comes from tradition, that comes from society, that comes from other persons, and the um, motive orientation, the person, the one you are trying to focus on has, this is what is, uh, what you should make interpretation about when you uh, are sitting with um, this long description of uh, everyday life situation. So I call it activity setting from the uh, in the model, but this same activity setting is from the single person's perspective, a social situation. So it's both an acti activity setting from the outside, but from the inside, from the person's perspective, it's a social situation. And this is. Um, it's still on a person's interactions in activity, in these activity settings uh, that are important. And how the child meets the demands in these activity settings. Perhaps there's demands that the child don't understand. It takes a crisis or conflict perhaps it went fluently. So here's the di dynamic or uh, in relation to the model. So from society's perspective, the process is the tradition and the, uh, the dynamic is the social conditions for this tradition. This, uh, from the institution's perspective, the process is the practice and it is I call it value motives or objectives. What are the objectives for school, for instance? Of course, it's uh, the motive for school. That it's values connected to this 
then there is activity sharing. This is the process, this is the social situation. And it is uh, motivation and demands in this. And then you can, uh, the person, it is activity, motives, and intention. And then you have a human uh, biology. And it's to say this is the drive of people's <coughs> needs and drives, as well as the societal conditions. So, the whole idea is to get these uh, different perspectives, I call, what are the uh, societal conditions, this is the perspective, what are the person's uh, pers perspective, this is the person's motive orientation, and uh, what are the the practice and what are the uh, demands of the practice. See, now I give you a task. And you get a small, very small. Uh, when I go out and make observation, usually I go out at uh, two, three hours at the minimum, several times. It is a research project. I made a project in the family. I went out <coughs> to each family, showed the time, with the children, making two or three hours observations. Um, and I wrote a book about two of the families together with uh, uh, a researcher from uh, Australia, and you can see the experiment, and this was that two Danish children and two uh, Australian children, and the Danish children are from middle class uh, families, the, uh, the Australian children are from uh, families that are on social service. And it's not the usual way to make experiment. What I do when I make this kind of comparison or say it's an experiment, it's to try to get the diversity, to see how different this is and what does, uh, uh, what does this mean, this difference for understanding what is going on. And of course what I was interested in, it was children, everyday life, the play, the uh, consensus to uh, in, in everyday life, uh, going to school, it was it. Um, this, so I go, so when you get this half page observation, it doesn't mean you should go out and do so little, <laughs> but at the same time you can get very much out making interpretation on half the page. There's not time of, uh, that you can do anything, but if uh, this table takes the three first questions, children's um, interaction in an activity setting create each child's situation. <coughs> this is for this table. And children learn through the demands and need participate in, in activity in an in activity setting this is for this group. And I would um, suggest that at least you work together two and two, perhaps four 
Yeah, I'm sitting with the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's a bit of a lie. 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 I guess they have an intention to they are sort of focusing on, on their sort own of kind of thing that they want to play with the interaction of the Yes, I was just the 
this is this is the first ball. Uh, what is the children's intention? So we had several issues with this, beginning by defining what you meant by children. Did you mean each specific intention, or how they, with their own intentions, combine into some sort of group intention? And how do you define intention? Is it <laughs> you define it from the result, and then you backtrack to the process that led to this result, and you assume that at different degrees of awareness there was some kind of intention? I define it in relation to each child. I take each child's uh, perspective. What do each child want? And of course, the next question will be how do they cooperate? And, well, there's not room for this, but. When I do my interpretation, I take each person's intentions and then I see how they cooperate or conflict or... Uh, because if I take the group intention, I couldn't see this and the cooperation or conflicts are very important. But this is not on this paper. <laughs> but can you so then answer? We did talk about how the, uh, the individual children were trying to play out some, uh, some social traditions actually that they're not yet a part of because I think they're in kindergarten. Um, I so would say this is on a second level of interpretation. What do, what is uh, Lisa, uh, Leila and Elsa, what are they oriented towards? The play. Yeah. Can you say more? I think that Lisa, uh, Lisa is more um, the social um, class, the princess, the um, it, it seems to me that they are from two social classes. Yeah, but this is also a second. You should be in the situation, and what can you see in this situation? Uh, it's true they want to play, they want to play together. No. But but the one wants to go right. Uh, on time to school, right? Yeah. And the other one wants to relax. Yeah, they, they, so that's they the first take on they, uh, they want, they are talking about going to school. And mm -hmm. what do you say, your group? Well, we also decided that they were probably just oriented towards playing together. Yeah. But they're also oriented towards school, don't you mm. think so? This is uh, uh, one of my main points. When you look at children's uh, intention or motive orientation, they transcend the concrete situation. Well, because kindergarten is a pre-stage to school. Yeah. So they're actually simulating yeah. the future. In yeah. A sense. And they are in their mind relating to another practice. Hmm. But then you might ask back: Do they also want to be princesses? Because that yeah. could be another yeah. intention also, because I think... Their intention at least is to play as they were princesses. And to play as if yeah. they were yeah. in school. <gasps> yeah. But, that's, but that's, school. Yes. that's two yeah. very different practices and two very different yeah. matrices But, but of, this of is practice. to get into the situation that there's more than the concrete situation mm. in the children's mm. minds mm. when they are playing. Mm. And this is to uh, to get this. Do you want to say anybody who wants to say more here? Yeah. Mm, I get the feeling mm -hmm. that when you see the overall um, uh, discussion or interaction, it's like they're they're playing out caricature versions of what they think are important things to discuss, yeah. and then they are regulating them one with yeah. each other. Yeah. And of course they're related to school because yeah. that's the setting. So it's a triadic interaction between children or peers and uh, their perception of the institution of school and yeah. maybe also... They are also in relation to this boy who are coming, mm. uh, they are, uh, have inten intention to uh, get some play material without making tr trouble. They make um, mm. what, do we, what do we say? A team. I think they're convening yeah. on yeah. which toys they should play with. In a way, yeah. they're establishing what's appropriate for them and the others, and that also that they shouldn't be mixed. That's what I see here. Yeah. 
and that's probably a reflection of their values, but at the same time, while enacting it, it becomes a reinforcement. You, you can see, I like my interpretation. I try to make it on several levels. The first one is that in the concrete situation, what is going on, and then you make it on the second level, and you already start on the second level. Uh, and I think it's fine because you have to do it, but to, to keep some validity uh, uh, and to see is that a repetition? What is going on n the next day? Uh, can you see some of the same uh, kind of, I call it motive orientation? Why I say intention here is because that's what I did when I started everything, and it's from the phenomenological tradition to talk about intention. But uh, this toy airplane, that's really tricky me <laughs> because, in a sense, it's kind of disturbing the airplane. And in another sense, they want it. So they use it as a mean to get something else. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's a way to see that they are oriented to a cooperation and not to go into a conflict. They could easily go into a conflict. But even before the boy comes and points out and says, oh, we need this, and, and, and then he says, we also have a queen, Leila already says, it's ours. So the pedagogue puts this toy, play, toy airplane on the table and, yeah. and the question is like, does the pedagogue knows that, does he know that they are having a play going on or is it no. she just cleaning up or what is going on? But already then Leila says, it's ours. Yeah, yeah. So but it's quite you have to see at the continuation in this, it's how is the continuation going from there? They say it's ours, but they also go into this deal that you can have it if we get something from you. Mm. So now we have this group. What are the demands? You start. Yeah. Well, we see part of the demands that, that are there all the time has to do with ideas about norms and normativity. So, you know, princesses should not, even princesses should not be late, you should not be late for school. Yeah. There is a detention that comes up. Yeah. So kind of outside of the very concrete play where there seems to be yeah. no rules, there are very strong ideas about things that should be done properly. Yeah. Demands coming from a practice outside. Coming from a practice outside, outside that governs problem. what it is that they do yeah. in the play activity. And the more we looked at that, we, we could see that kind of coming yeah. all over the place. It's very important. Uh, to transcend the concrete, to see how something spills in from other practices. But there's also demands in this practice. What, what yeah. did you say? Yeah, we discussed that um, there are some very concrete demands uh, in, in the toys themselves. They yeah. have these pieces yeah. that they are centered uh, around. Yeah. And uh, in the social sense that they are two playing together. So yeah. that create some demands uh, from uh, for cooperation. And all the demands for each other, on, on the good demands for each other, I think. Uh, yeah, but it's, yeah. it seems that they they want to play together, so there's an underlining yeah. demand to uh, to want to contribute and, and not break up the, the playing. kind of 
growing out of kids going next to it, so mm -hmm. they're, they're going from the plane where they're playing house or going to school. Yeah. And then the, the pedagogue comes in and puts a pen on the yeah. table, and then you go into a different uh, context where they need to negotiate to get the toy. Yeah. And when they get back to the show, they come yeah. on, let's play yeah. again. They, they take um, something that happened mm -hmm. while they were away. While yeah. they were away, they need to go into detention because yeah. they came late. When they left the game, mm. they yeah. left the, the, the play, they were on time in school. Yeah. So they need to go out to another context and when they came back, it interacted with the, with the first uh, yeah. setting they, yeah. they were in. Uh, and, and they, as they kept up, they went from one context to another. No, so we, I, I think Charlotte brought up something very interesting about sort of the disruptive nature of the toy playing group being brought in, yeah. with the children converging on, on one hand having two different play themes that they seem to have as their individual intentionalities, yeah. that the one wants to bring in the notion of kings and princesses and one is playing school, they can make that work together, the princess can go to school, that's yeah. work. And then what happens when, when the toy playing shows up and something, some, some new intentionalities are kind of brought in. Yeah. Anybody who wants to say something? Uh, yeah. I think that there is some uh, sexual aspect also because of this airplane and princess. Yeah, and yeah. <coughs> uh, there is yeah. a separation in sex yeah. which is probably related yeah. to the background. But that's also, I would say, second. But the, the absolutely, the yeah. you see, what this is my way of making interpretation of an observation. It's not that you should use exactly. I, I gave my theory and I gave why do I use motive orientation and why do I use demand. Perhaps that's not uh, what you would do. The next step I would uh, uh, go forward with is where are the conflicts and where are the co uh, corporations between these. And I would make the analysis. But the whole idea is to say that you have to have a theoretical standpoint and find the concepts you're going to use and going out to make observation is not enough. It is to make the interpretation. And of course, if you don't go out to make observation, or some do, uh, this Jonathan uh, Trotz has brought up, and he, go, he went out with a, a, a category scheme and then cross off and then in between he wrote, wrote, wrote uh, uh, he did this for 30 seconds uh, every five minutes or something like this. This is the way you can make observation. I do it just being there, uh, going into interaction with the persons. Uh, here is not any interaction with the observer, but you are in interaction with the persons when you are up there. And it means that you can, if you don't understand what is going on, you can say, oh, what are you doing? Or, uh, and you relate to, to the persons. And then you come home with, with this material. Um, and even if I don't use the categories, uh, you know, my, my theoretical uh, background or how I define myself, I want to have this bonus approach is to define what I'm looking for and of course what, what the aim is. So this is what this is what I wanted to put forward. It is this interpretation and be clear about your concepts and get them to relate. And the, what I think is difficult is to find the units. I use the activity setting, but how to get units in such a long flow of observation. This is also a problem. So this is what I wanted to say. Time is gone. Mm -hmm.